All right. Excellent. Okay. So we're recording. So hi, everyone. Welcome to TTT. Paul is not available this Wednesday, um, July 17th. So he asked me, Marina Lombardo, I'm changing it to Pisto. So you'll start seeing Marina Pisto a little bit more um, to host and get things going this evening. And we're really lucky today because we have Amia here and she's going to share a little bit about what she's up, been up to with artificial intelligence. But like Paul always does, I think we should start with just a quick introduction so that everybody can say who they are, what they do, and I guess what brings them here this evening. And whoever wants to get started can get it going. I'm trying to do it like Paul style. I'll start. Thanks, David. Just before you start, so Paul's not here, Marina. You're 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 the stand-in for Paul. Is that right? I am stepping in this evening. Yes. <laughs> oh, and you're doing a fabulous job. My name is David Cole. I live in Berkeley, California, and I work with a small company called NextMap, and I've been experimenting with AI since it was announced, and I've been really enjoying and appreciating the conversations here at TTT. Okay, I can go next. Nice to meet you. My name is Amia, and I'm going into 10th grade this school year, and I go to Ridge High School in <laughs> Ridge, New Jersey. And I've been playing around with AI since eighth grade, and I've started to get really into, like, advocating for how AI should be used in education. I'm really passionate about that. <laughs> nice. Excellent. I'm uh, Christina Cantrell. <laughs> Hello. I'm cooking dinner right now, so sorry about that. But thank you for hosting, Marina. Um, I work for the National Writing Project, and I've been a longtime fan of TTT. Um, and um, Amia, I you know, I'm interested that um, there was the the group, right, about students advocating for AI. So anyway, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Paul Hankins. I teach at Silver Creek High School in Sellersburg, Indiana, which is right across the bridge from Louisville, Kentucky. I missed last week's conversation because I was in a week-long summer institute um, for AP literature, so I'm I'm back tonight, and I'm really really excited uh, to hear from a rising uh, rising sophomore, right? So tenth grade, uh, that's a that's an interesting year. I've never taught tenth grade. I taught eleventh grade for a number of years, and then I matriculate up to a all senior schedule. But uh, I'm always looking at rising sophomores and uh, how they start to establish themselves in the building and. They start to, like, they're in that tension, right? Uh, the Safa, right? Safa, the sophist, wise. And then the more, the fool, right? The wise fool and the tension, the pulling uh, between those two things, right? So I'm, I'm excited to hear from you tonight, Amia. Thank you. And I am Marina Pisto Lombardo. I'm a third grade general education teacher at Pecanico Hills Central School District in Sleepy Hollow, New York. And I have had the pleasure of listening to Amia many, many times while I've been on the phone with Alana Winnick, who um, is supporting her and a, and a couple of other students as they're developing this um, adv advocacy work around artificial intelligence. And on another note, um, my third graders this year sat on a few panels with Amia, and um, I... I'm just excited to hear from you um, because I know that you've made such an impact on uh, my children and they spread that that message um, to other children. And, um, and, and thank you for being so positive and sharing with them like why all of this is important for their future. So I'm gonna hand it over to you so that you can share with us just what you've been up to. Um, we know that you did a big presentation um, with your teacher at Drew University, and you've been working on this project um, with Alana. And um, so the floor is yours. Thank you. So um, I'm going to share my screen, but I guess first I'll start talking a little bit about the project. So um, can you guys see? Uh, Not yet. OK, one second. Can you guys see the screen now? Yes. 
Awesome. So this is our website and our organization is called Students for Innovation. And what we're focusing on right now is just kind of building awareness about um, artificial intelligence in education. And we're trying to work on how, how we can um, help teachers and students try to um, include more of artificial intelligence in their curriculums. And we kind of want to work towards like convincing administrators, convincing teachers that artificial intelligence is really here to help students grow. And it's and it's, it should be used as a tool in the classroom. So we've started putting together some resources and some content to share with um, communities of students and teachers who are kind of leaders in, in education and who want to get started on this next big thing because AI right now, as everyone here obviously knows, it's it's a big thing right now and it's here to stay. And so we've just started making a few videos and we started with a little bit of content. Um, I'll show you guys a conversation starter um, We made a piece we made. So we're kind of putting together content right now and uh, it would be great if you guys wanted to kind of visit our webpage and click get started so that you could put your emails in because then we'll send you guys emails whenever we have new content and everything. And so um, can you guys see this PDF? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is kind of like a teaser to a free downloadable that we created. And so it has conversation starters. And so we want teachers to be able to talk to their students and kind of go into like the discussion. Like, you know, in the first week of school, when teachers are setting guidelines for students for what they want for the rest of the year, how they want their students to um, approach the work that they're doing in that class. So we want AI to become a big part of this conversation that happens in the, in the beginning of the school year, because it's such a big deal. You can't just ignore it or like not even talk about it because students need to know what teachers are expecting from them. So of course, every teacher is going to have their kind of own like guidelines for what, how much AI they want their students to use. They're okay with students using, but we want teachers to get more comfortable with um, students using AI because we've seen how much AI can actually enhance creativity and both ourselves and other students like um, Miss Lombardo's own third graders, we've seen that their own experiences about how they've used AI in school have actually helped them and they talk so much about it. It's wonderful. But um, for example, here we talk about how um, teachers should start conversations about like um, how much a how much AI is too much and kind of going back and forth with their students because it's important to see what the students think too. And these conversation starters kind of just create a conversation about AI, which is the most important thing. We can't just ignore it. And so this is just like a teaser of that. We have a full free downloadable with a lot more of these conversation starters. And so if you like sign up on our website, then you you could get access to the free downloadable. Um, and then another part of what we have are these scenarios that also are for teachers to talk to their students about. So they're just scenarios about what students could be doing in class and then whether and then different discussion questions based off of that about like kind of along the lines of whether it's correct incorrect but also like what makes what makes using ai different and different conversations that teachers can have with their students so these are just a few of the scenarios and there's a lot more um on our full version but that's just a little bit about that and we've kind of been working towards getting more places where we can present our own voices, because I know a lot of times people don't really get to hear from students, but we're the ones on the receiving end of everything of, of education. And so I think it's really important that people get to hear from students because we know how much artificial intelligence used in education affects us. And we know what a big positive impact it can have on us because um, like me, myself, I've used it in, in many ways to enhance my creativity, which I can talk about after we go into some other things. But also, if you guys have any questions, like while I'm talking, just feel free to unmute and ask me. But I guess I can get started with the writing partners. So I guess you all know um, about Mr. Allison and the writing partners website 
he has correct me if i'm wrong but um miss Dodronsky, my eighth grade teacher who i've been working with as well and i have been um playing around with the writing partners and kind of putting in our own pieces that we did in school that we did outside of school and we've been putting them into the writing partner website creating our own writing partners and so i want to show you guys a writing partner that i created for um a research project that i did in school this year so this is just a slide that i have so i'll talk through this so um First of all, the research project that I had was to research about a country and a big problem in that country that I would be passionate about. So my research project was on India and I chose the problem about the Hindu Muslim tensions in India. And so I created my research paper. I didn't use artificial intelligence for this because my teachers at my school are pretty strict about it, which we should, which we're working towards changing because we do want to incorporate more artificial intelligence. But I didn't use artificial intelligence to make my research paper. But after I submitted it over the summer, I started playing around with the writing partners. And so I wanted to see how much bias um, a writing partner could identify in my research. I wanted to see like whether it thought my research was really biased or not. So I made my own writing partner and I called it identifying bias. And so I gave it like five specific steps for how it should um, describe whether I have bias in my um, research or not. And so the first thing was to rate the bias on a scale of one to 10. But then I also asked it to explain the rating. So I asked it to give like an example of what one would be and an example of what 10 would be so that we kind of get an idea of the scale and itself it knows what the scale is because it's really important to be like specific when you're working with ai and so then i just asked it to do um to identify areas that are biased and describe what parts of the writing make it biased and then i also asked it to provide tips for me to how to make my writing less biased and then i also tried using um a writing partner that mr allison himself created and i put in the question for um how um how biased is my writing or pop mr allison put um the question in and i found that the results from my own writing partner was a lot better because i think it's a lot more um catered to what exactly i want from it so let's go here so this is my research paper it's like 50, 45 pages long it's a long research um document and so right here i put in my um, uh we're not seeing it now so. what, what are you seeing when you when you share your screen well i'm not seeing your screen being shared right now okay. and in and this platform you have to like change you have to each tab you need to switch to to show show a tab oh okay so did did, did you were you able to see this slide or no not at yes. all yeah oh, okay slide, yeah. okay then let me go to the so if you go to the tab and then share again there's also like a way to switch within but okay can you see it now yes, yes. okay perfect so um this is what i got out of what i put in and i got a bias rating of eight which is pretty high and so um it kind of explained that uh it, it was biased because of um the political aspects i was talking about and parts like this. But the most important part to me was the tips. And it told me that um, I should introduce more credible arguments from both sides. And then when I kind of looked back at my research paper, I realized that a lot of the sources I used were more biased to one side than the other. And so um, the idea of like using more credible arguments for that one for the side that um, I was not too biased towards would make a lot of sense. And then like language, I did use a lot of this language and some of, some of its feedback, I don't necessarily agree with because some, some language is important to use. And so this is like the part of AI that I think is really important because you're not going to just take everything that it gives you and agree with it and move on. You have to, it makes you think harder when you look at what it gives you. And then you think about what, what you want to take from that. And that's kind of the part that enhances your own creativity. And that's what helps me the most. Mm -hmm. And then for this writing partner, which is the one that Mr. Allison created, 
Um, it was kind of more general because the writing partner itself didn't have specific steps relating to bias. So it just gave me the general, like the general thing, the general rules that someone would look at to see if there's bias. It wasn't really specific to my research paper too much. And so I think that when I, I was really much more specific with what I put into the AI, it came out with a much better um, response. So that's a big part of it. And mm. then another piece. I mean, I think I'm seeing that it was able to pull out specific quotes from your document and say, these are examples of X. Like, yeah. Did, was that, did you find that, that to be accurate? The things it was selecting and the categories it was assigning to those um, excerpts were aligned? Uh, so, yeah, so over here, it took mm -hmm. out a quote that says, blaming Muslims for India's population growth is purely Hindu propaganda. Mm -hmm. And so this quote wasn't like something that I said. It was like a quote that I took from another source. So mm -hmm. I don't agree with that because the purpose of me putting that quote in is to show what the source said. It's not really my yeah. thought there. Sure. So I think that's where it kind of went wrong. And I could be more specific in my prompt to kind of fix this now that I'm seeing what it gave out. But the second one, it's it's something that um, I think it might be something that I said. Um, but I feel like I don't necessarily agree with I don't necessarily agree with the quotes that it used yet. Mm -hmm. So I think that's like a big part of it, like kind of figuring out what you agree with, what you don't agree with. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's generally. I think some some of the feedback is definitely helpful though. So. Just an aside, did I hear you say this is a 45-page research paper? Yeah, it's like 40, 45 pages, yeah. And you, so you wrote that a 45-page research paper in ninth grade, yes? Yeah, in ninth grade, over like three, four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Wow. How, how, many, how, how, much, what, how, much, what, how many footnotes and citations went into that? I'm curious. Oh, there's a lot. Um, let, me, mm -hmm. let me go all the way down. So, it, were you using AI for the research on that? Was it pulling no. things up and you were checking it? These were this was all your own research. This is all my own. So mm -hmm. it's these are all the sources. Yeah, it's it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You it's were impressive. when you were talking in at Drew, you were talking about um some of the sources were by like you, that you used lots of sources that kind of had the same point of view is that yeah so i mean? i kind of realized that when i did when i looked at this too is a lot of the sources i used had a similar point of view that was kind of the same bias that my writing or my research kind of went along so i guess that really does show how like the sources you use what you read influences your own your own bias your own thoughts so i mean like trying to find more sources that align with the other side of it would also probably help me. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can you guys see the one yeah. that sparks and starts? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So this is another piece of, or a journal actually, that I did in eighth grade when I had Miss Dejronsky. I don't know if any of you guys know her, but um, I, it's like a journal where we were given an input piece of writing and then we would have to do a reflection based off of each of those um, pieces we were given. So each day um, she would, my teacher would read us like a little excerpt from some book or a poem or anything and then we would have to write about it. And so um, it's, it's a lot, it's like from, um, I don't know, I think we did like one a week. So there's quite a few entries. So I wanted to see what it could take from what I wrote and then how, what it could say about me from that. And mm -hmm. so um, I called this writing partner that I made uncovering personal themes because I wanted to see what it could tell me about myself. Mm -hmm. And so before I talk about it, I kind of realized that it might be a little bit off of like me myself, because a lot of it is based off of what the inspiration, inspiration pieces were like if the piece itself was about worries then what I'm writing about even though it's about myself I'm writing about my own worries or anything like that 
but at the same time like within those topics what it could tell me about myself so it told me the recurring topics which are right but those are kind of based off of the inspiration pieces but then after that when it talked i asked it to give me roots and branches of the topics that was kind of an idea that miss um, my teacher and i came up with because we wanted to see whether it was it was able to understand that kind of figurative like language and it did it did it told me like something that could stem off of each of the um, recurring topics that relate to me that come up in my writing a lot and then what I could then take from that and then write about later so the roots over here that are under worries and stress personal expectations is a really big one like whenever I think of worries and stress I usually think of my personal expectations so I do think it got that right on it was it was really right about that and so then when it talks about the branches um these are all like really good topics that I would I could definitely find myself studying or researching so I think it did a pretty good job in this in this um aspect and mm. even in these like hate and love that was a recurring topic and so close relationships was definitely a big one and then I I did talk about all of these all of all of these roots and then the branches just give me more ideas and kind of inspiration so I think I also use AI a lot on my own to ins to help me like get a starting point, a jumping off point, and to like in give me inspiration for what to write about mm -hmm. if I don't have um, like a concrete idea yet. And then I can go off of that on my own. And then the last part of this uh, writing partner that I think was interesting is we asked it to create inquiry questions and we asked it to create it at a ninth grade level. And so these questions are like, again, questions that I would then take and then study or research and write about and that I would actually find interesting. And so they kind of are like, they kind of relate to the branches in a way, like how can changing one's mindset impact their daily routines and reduce stress and worries? That's, that's a big part of what I wrote about. And whenever I talked about worries, I thought I talked about our mindset because one of the books I read during that year was about the growth mindset. And I talked a lot about the mindset. So I think this writing partner was pretty successful and I think I could use it definitely to give me, give myself inspiration if I was ever at like a lost point for what I wanted to research. Mm. Yeah. That's great. This was something you, was this, was this done for the purpose of developing another um, project or was this just your own sort of reflection on the content you'd built up over the time that you were doing these sparks and starts? You just wanted to inventory it yeah i kind of just over it, it was in the summer my teacher from eighth grade reached out to me and she was like she asked me to do a presentation at drew and so oh. i was kind of just filling around with some of the old things i'd written and like writing partners that i could create like something that i try to take some of the things i've written and then i tried to see like what i want to know from those Mm -hmm. using AI. So I wanted to know like what it could tell me about myself. For the other one, I wanted to know whether it could say how biased I was. So sure. I, I think it was it was a really interesting experience. And I mean, if I had this during eighth grade, I would have definitely used it to give me like more of a like basis off what I could then like stem off and study next or read about next. And I think it would have been really fun. But yeah, I'll definitely use it in the future. That's uh, that's that's really impressive, Amia. Thank you. It's really neat that Amia has uh, a cache of these little writing samples, right? I don't mean to use the word yeah. "little" pejoratively. Um, so I just I'm a little bit late to this book, but there's a a recent book that just came out, hundred word stories, um, as kind of like a micro form, and uh, this so I'm really digging on it as a as a craft form as a short form uh, style of writing. And I can see students like Amia um, having like a, a portfolio of these 100 word entries where they're not being tasked. I'm still horribly impressed with a 45 page research paper, but by plugging <laughs> in these micro forms, look what she's getting by way of essential questions at the bottom. So the AI, the writing partners are, are crafting those Here's here's another question to grow on. They, the the writing partner crafted those questions at the bottom of the right hand side. Yeah. Sometimes crafting an essential question for research can be a really tricky kind of thing, and these are based on 
what you have already proven by way of your writing uh, that you're, uh, you know, maybe even subconsciously trying to pursue. This is like a little, a little nudge, a little tap, a little, okay, you go. Uh, this, this is the direction you seem to be going. But Amia, like all through your presentation tonight, I love that you still have agency and saying, boy, I don't know if I agree with that. There's a reason that I did that. There's a reason that I'm doing this. And uh, while I appreciate the feedback over here, I'm also, right, I'm licensed here to to reject uh, any suggestions as well. So that's that's good ownership. Wow. Yeah, I think, I think that's one of the biggest things that teachers have to teach because in a lot of like the presentations that I give, it's not just about allowing students to use AI, it's about teaching them how to use AI because like, like anything like schools for teaching. So where they're going to use AI when they, when they're in their jobs and in college and everything. So they have to be taught how to use it when they're in school, that that's the point of school. So when you like teach a student how to take what they got from AI to filter through it, to take what they really like think is useful from that and then discard the rest of it. I think it's a really important skill to have. You're using the you're using AI primarily to critique work you've created, original work you've created, and from that you're extrapolating different <clears throat> different understandings and different possible subsequent directions. Um, I mean, I guess generally you could say you're using it as a revision tool, not as a content creation tool. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. But um, like in this case, I'm taking what I'm like finished with, and then I'm trying to come up with new ideas for what I could do next. Right. So I feel like it's also for like brainstorming. And mm -hmm. I have used AI in the past to help me like um, organize my ideas if I'm like starting out on a project. So mm -hmm. that's, I guess that's also part of like the brainstorming process. So I use it for brainstorming and revision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really interesting. Really great. When you were, when, so the, the project that you're starting with Alana, are you being asked to go to classes within your school or across your district and sort of walk people through your experience as a way to motivate them, reassure them, get their comfort levels higher? What's the objective of that group? Is it a advocacy group? Is it a practice yeah, so, group? So it is an advocacy group. Our goal is to like have each student start a chapter of the group at their own schools and then okay. go and like present to their teachers. So we haven't exactly like gone to that stage yet because we have to create more content if we want to be able to present to a teacher and actually persuade them for what sure. we want. So we're working towards that. But once we get enough content for that, our plan is for each of us to go to the teachers that we think are going to be like the most, like the, the easiest to persuade, the ones that are actually going to understand what we're talking about. We're going to sure. present to them. We're going to like get, I guess, get them on our side, I guess. And then, okay once they understand what we what we are saying then we kind of like build build onto that foundation and we hope we're hoping that like in each school they get bigger and bigger until like we can present to administration and because at our uh, in our district i know we've like a lot of teachers like my eighth grade teacher have been struggling to like get administration to even allow ai use at all which mm -hmm. is a big problem because like the administration is is a big part of it and she was telling me the other day like they they just keep telling me that they haven't uh, created a position on on the topic yet so i mean we have to like i guess convince them first before we can do anything else so we need teacher support for that so that's our plan as of right now and then hopefully we like want to expand to more and more schools as we get more and more students as part of our organization so that's why it's like we're trying to get it out to teachers as well because then if teachers are able to um, get students who they think would be passionate about it too then we can expand more and more which that's our goal yeah that's a great goal i was thinking so when i when i mentioned your um this uh, students for innovation uh amia earlier i said that you're advocating for ai and the more I was thinking about it, I was like, wait a minute, really what you're advocating is for conversations between teachers and students about the use of new technologies for the work that you're doing together, right? And I I feel like in some ways that, that gets at like what's so important to me about this is that 
that you're advocating for for an engaged conversation between you, right? And that that you know, because the I mean, there are lots of questions about AI. You know, I was just looking at a thing that was that talked about how much energy is being used um, uh, right now. You know, just yes, using using AI today. Um, and I understand like lots of people have lots of ethical questions, but those are exactly the kind of questions that teachers and students should be talking about together, right? Like exactly. these are like really important questions beyond just using it. There's also like the the implications of AI in our world. And and as colleagues of mine talk about, they talk about what does it mean to be human today? Like in the context of AI, what does it mean to be human? Like some of these like really big questions. And so what I love about what you're advocating for is, is it, it seems to me like fundamentally it's about those conversations. And anyway, I just appreciate that. And I think um, more of us should be advocating for students and teachers to be able to talk and make decisions about these things together. Yeah, and there's actually like a little bit of a funny story behind that. So when we uh -huh. started our, our organization, it was like a few students and Miss Winnick. And so when we were talking, one of the students was like, uh, we were trying to figure out a name for what we wanted our organization to be called. And one of the other students was like, oh, let's call it Students for AI. But then we like got into this conversation and we were like, well, right now AI is what we're advocating for right now. That's what the biggest that's what the biggest thing is in education and that's what we need. But like in down the line in like 10 years and however many years, it's not going to be AI, it's going to be something new. And so like we need to be able to advocate for whatever is necessary in education. So exactly what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really powerful insight. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This is if I can piggyback on what uh, Christina was just sharing with you. This is really um, refreshing in that, you know, students of my generation, I graduated in 1988. If we got upset about something that was happening in the building or decisions the administration was making, we would we would walk out, you know? And so here's Amia and uh, they're showing up. They're sitting down. They're asking for a place at the table, and I and I hope that they I hope that they find it. Um, you know, I hope that teachers like me and others uh, might uh, uh, join the effort, bring this to my school. I love. Um, I, I think it was Amia or maybe Christina uh, said this, but the the idea of just saying no to something without having a position statement at all. That, that yeah, that doesn't sit well with me as an adult. I can't imagine it sits well with a fifteen or a sixteen year old. So. Uh, bravo, kudos. I mean, this is a, right. And I, and I love the evolution of a project. Yeah. Yeah. This was about AI in the beginning, but now it's really about what's coming down the road. And I think one of the most powerful things you've said tonight was this is something we're going to use for school. And this is something that we're going to use for the way that we're going to learn. Isn't that what school is for to show us how to use these tools and use them effectively. That is really rich stuff. So, man, I, boy, I'm glad I came back tonight. This is uh, <laughs> I would I would have paid for this. <laughs> I mean, are you are you going to be doing actually educator training uh, or actually work in like breakout sessions? I mean, people in districts have professional development days where teachers like Marina and Paul will find themselves with their colleagues in a room learning a certain thing, right? And um, is, do you and Alana have that as a kind of um, component of what you guys are doing as you go around and do, do your work? Yeah, I mean, we're we're trying to like present and talk at anything we can. We we are actually looking to see like what districts will let us like help like go talk at their professional development. I think one of the presentations we did online, I think it was the um, pre ISTE. I think one of those presentations, but there was someone there who told us they were like, Oh, we'd really want you guys to like come and talk to our district, um, in professional development. And I, and I hope that works out because I think that like getting to teachers is really helpful too, because they, they're, they're the people that we need to like convince or talk to. And 
I mean, that's that's what we I mean, I'm we're open to doing it anywhere. So like if you guys if you know anybody, any like teacher or school that would allow us to come and talk to the teachers, like I'd be more than happy to. Mm -hmm. I bet you would. That'd be great. Yeah. Have you been involved in situations where you're actually getting teachers um, on their computers or on their devices using AI and sort of walking them through the kind of thing you're doing? Yeah. So a lot of teachers, they use AI to help them like grade work or to check tests or to check anything. And then they won't let us use it to help us when we're doing work. And that's just that that's just a part of like what is it's so infuriating to us because <laughs> when a teacher is using it for their own benefit and it's actually helping them, why can't they help us when it's actually going to help us too? I think the biggest thing is they don't understand. They they think that students are going are will use it to cheat. That's what they always right. say. But the biggest thing with that is it's not like with anything, students who want to cheat will find a way to do it. And it's not AI that's going to make them like cheat. It's, I mean, there was even, I, I told, I talked about this at Drew too. There was a study that was published um, that, that showed that the cheating rates didn't increase from before AI was introduced to now when it's a big, a big deal in, in everywhere. And I think what teachers need to understand is that like AI, we want it and it's actually going to help us they think that it's going to hurt us that's their it's not like they, they obviously want the best for us but we just have to convince them and show them how it'll actually help us yeah so that's our job yeah in the chat i put a couple um articles and one of them is by um hillary walker at the bay area writing project and some other um researchers and they were looking at kind of um, teacher and student responses to some AI prompts and activities. And there there was a lot of agreement or, between students and teachers about what learn, what was learned and where the learning was happening. But there was disagreement about where the cheating was happening. And mm -hmm. I and so again, it's really like they conclude that teachers and students need to talk to each other about this work. And one of the things that I, I only read it, I read it once, so I'm not an expert in this article at all. So, um, but what I remember from it was this idea that um, that it, that teachers often talked about how it depended on the context. You know, it sort of depended on what the teacher was trying to support the student in doing. And depending on context, it, it like their opinion, whether something was more cheat, cheating <laughs> would change. So it's an interesting, anyway, I put it there if it's helpful um, to your conversations. Um, and the other one is an article by Amy Sterniello, who is the director of the Philadelphia Writing Project. And she talks about youth as technological philosophers. This idea that um, that that youth have a lot of opinions and a lot of thoughts on new technologies as soon as they emerge, and because they are active users. Um, so, anyway, those two might be of interest. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, those are really good articles. Amia, when you're using uh, when you're using AI in your classes, are, is it so is it so sort of is it so driven by individual teachers and informal in that fashion that you guys are or are not communicating to the parent to the parent community? When you use an AI in an AI in your class or you're going to use it in your writing, is there something that goes home to the family members or no? It's just the teacher. No, I think like what our district is doing, they're just scared to even like open up a discussion about it because. They, they like told, they told us that they don't have a position on it yet, which is right. like their version of saying no, but they haven't like told anything to teachers. They haven't told anything to the parents. They haven't told anything to us. That's for sure. So they don't have like a position on it. They haven't talked about it. They're just, I think they're just scared. They don't know what to do. And so they don't, they don't want to talk to anyone about it, but I, that's just, I think that's the wrong thing to do. We think like discussions are what's needed. Like, like, um, 
yeah. you're all saying. So nothing's gone to the parents to answer your question. And when we use it in in schools, like it's it's basically up to the teacher. And usually the teacher says, "Don't use it at all. I'm going to catch you if you use it. I'm going to put it into chat or into GPT zero, which doesn't even work." So. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like it's a pretty big mess. So we need to open up discussions to to figure everything out. Yeah, I'll say that's great. Although one thing I would say is that like when certain teachers are like let's take let's take my eighth grade teacher, your eighth grade teacher, Mr. Doronsky, as an example. When she does use AI, she made us like write letters and stuff, and then send them back to our parents about how we were using AI and doing other projects in her classroom. So when teachers are open to it, they do generally communicate with parents. But I do think it's really happening on a district level. Yeah, I do agree. But I, I mean, Mr. Dronsky is like a really one of a kind teacher. I, I don't think there's anybody else in our whole district who's like her and who, who's so, I mean, who embraces AI as much as she does. I mean, yeah. I mean, I have other te people like teachers who have who are embracing AI, although to like less of an extent. Like they're not going to teach their whole classes. Like I know Dr. Belisha down in the middle school, he made one of the biggest things I used AI for this year was I used it in debate and I generated like all my arguments um, for for that. And I also ended up, I was, I'm in the, our high school debate team also runs like a summer camp. So I've been in that for like the last two weeks. And over there, I ended up talking to um, Mr. Y, the head coach. And then he said that he's also open to AI. And in fact, that the national debate league even it was also open to AI. So I think there's definitely some people that are more open to it in than others. It's not like a, it's, it's more of a spectrum. It's interesting that the debate league is open to it. Like it's, in, I think it's interesting that these sort of connected spaces, that seems like something to, to talk about yeah, like, with teachers. That's interesting. Like debate is all about sharing your debate and speech is all about sharing your voices and sharing your opinions and i feel like that probably has a lot that, that has a lot to do with letting giving students the freedom to explore ai and other uh emerging technologies i suppose also aditya the, the the product that you generate in your debate is a free form real-time spoken expression of your understanding right it's not like you're submitting something so yeah. Whatever you if can you, do, prep yourself. It's, you, still gonna yeah. be, it's still going to be you uh, delivering real time thinking. You know, like if you don't understand your debate, like I've been in debates before where I have I've had like partners mm -hmm. who I, they don't do any work beforehand, and then I literally just hand them a piece of paper on the day, like this is what you're speaking. I I'm, you didn't do any work, and then they end up going into the debate, and they have no idea what they're talking about. They end up talking like really choppy and stuff. And over, and then you see it even reflected in scores and things where people like me and my uh, some other friends who actually do even while using AI, we understand what we're talking about. We end right. up with usually higher scores than those other people because yep. we because even if we're using AI and other aids to generate material, we're going through and actually trying to understand it rather than yep. like just spitting out whatever our teammates give us mm -hmm. on the day. Just a technical question about using the AI to prep debate. Are you using it to actually, you, you hear about this in the presidential debates and elsewhere, where, you know, there's someone who plays the role of somebody else, right? Are you practicing, are you rehearsing actual public speaking with, with the AI, or is that something you do primarily just, you know, you facilitate among yourselves in terms of the public mostly speaking? Mostly we facilitate it among ourselves. The AI is mostly like what we're going to be speaking with, for example, I can even give an example right now at debate camp, we were doing a debate on uh, the electoral college. So mm -hmm. I used AI, so we had like at about a couple hours prep. So mm -hmm. I used AI to generate all my talking points. And then I went out and I bought, I got statistics examples from past like things like past presidential debates, for example, I bought in examples and then we practiced the public speaking primarily among ourselves before we ended up having a showcase with like the entire camp and all our parents and stuff. Sure. I actually, when when the Chat GPT four came out with the 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 part that allows you to use the voice, I'm um, talking back and forth with it. I tried asking it. I I like tried having a debate with it. I asked it um, to debate with me on whether AI should be used in the classroom, and so um, I told it to take the side that it shouldn't, and then I debated with it, and then it said I won by the end of it. I was like, at the end, I was like. 
um, I, I have all these, like, I told you all these things that you didn't like refute. So I think I won. And it was like, yeah, you won. And then I told it to switch and do the other side. <laughs> and then I still ended up winning it. So I think that right now the technology isn't like too advanced enough for that. But I think that in the very near future, like people like you, like debaters could use AI to help to help you guys yeah. get stronger because I think eventually like it'll be a lot harder to like win over AI. It'll be a lot stronger with giving re rebuttals and everything. Yeah, maybe when five mil releases, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> bro, I had a train of thought somewhere. I just lost it. Uh, oh yeah. Um, no, never mind. You guys, I'm getting a phone call from uh, my son. I'm going to have to jump away. But thank you, Amia. And thank you all. It's been really, it's very inspiring to see what you're doing, Amia. It'll be fun to follow that. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. Of course. It's my pleasure. Really great. All right. Good night, you all. Thanks, David. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, David. I was thinking about the amount of, because I, so I, um, because I saw Amia and your classmate at Drew, what your classmate's name? Ashna. 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 Um, I saw the two of them present with Jill. And Jill also provided a lot of context about her classroom. So it was really interesting to me. Um, and Marina, this is seems to be true in your classroom too. These are very writing centered classrooms. Like you're the you're generating a lot of content. And Paul, you said that, I think, when like you were talking about the sh like short pieces, these collection of short pieces that Amia has. You know, there was, there's just a lot of writing in her class. In fact, I think that there's, you guys can keep four different journals, right, Amia? Yeah. In that class? Yeah. So I just was thinking about the implications of that versus a classroom where or or Adisha's, you know, debate where, you know, he's sort of doing the research but then has to present. You know, there's just I don't know. I feel like those contexts it AI can be a real tool in those contexts. And I feel like in some contexts it might be I can see why people would be nervous because maybe there's just like less to work with or there's, you know, less um the the students might just be um, writing less. So there's sort of less development of fluency around how to use some of these tools. I don't know. I just was thinking about the think relationship. I don't remember who said this, but I remember someone say, saying something about how AI is going to leave classrooms to become less about the product and, let, and more about the process, how it's going to mm. be more about how you create the essay and less about how what the essay actually right. is. Right, nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you feel like that's what you see or experience? Uh, currently, not really, unless you're counting Ms. Deronti's classroom, but like in a data set, she's the outlier, so can't exactly count that. I know that there are some, I know that in classes there are, there's some more of a shift, like teachers are starting to do more projects and other things, uh, definitely, but still I feel like there's like a lot of focus on writing essays and getting the uh, the products. Yeah, I think that's another thing that we're trying to do with students for innovation. We're trying to like tell teachers that um, the assignments that they create have to be more about checking progress and the process over just the final product. Because even if like a student's given an assignment to write an essay, it's about like the process of that. And um, you can allow them to use AI, you can allow them to improve their creativity. If you give them the assignment that they have to check in with you. They have to like send you what they put into AI, what AI gave them and how they kind of edited their own writing using AI and other assignments like that. And even like another topic we we're talking about is like an assignment where even a debate, an assignment like a debate where you have to do a research project to get to that. And like um, Aditya was saying, mm -hmm to be able to debate, you have to know what you're talking about. So you would have to be able to do the research, you would have to be able to do the writing part of it in order to do well in the debate. And a lot of times students are nervous about public speaking, so they are going to prepare for for that. So that's a really good like process where 
you're learning a lot, you're researching, you're writing, you're doing all of that, and you're using AI to help you as a tool during that process. I think one thing that I think would be useful in trying to convince a teacher about how AI is really more of a tool than a hindrance is I like, like when I sometimes like ask my teachers if I can use AI in a project, I'm like, well, I can provide to you, uh, I can show you like the, let's say it's an essay, for example, I can show you the essay before, like what I would have turned in originally. And then I can show you what it was like afterwards. And then I can even show you how the AI was generating and feedback and what I, what prompts I put in, which number one, it kind of helps the teacher like, okay, if I want to actually uh, start using AI more in the classroom, here's some kind of prompts and other things that I can use. And then number two, show them that you, that AI can really be a tool rather than a hindrance. And I think that even if they format it like that, like, oh, if you want to use AI in your essays, then you have to show me a pre-AI and a post-AI. I think that would be still okay. Like, it, uh, I would still be okay with that, like, as a kind of a bridge to getting, to allowing, like, unrestricted AI, or maybe not unrestricted, but ethically ethical AI use in classrooms. Yeah, one thing that um, Alana and I did with the third grader, so eight, nine years old, is we actually um, used perplexity AI with them because they were able to, first of all, they didn't have to log in. And then they were able to, they were, they had to send the link to the conversation so that we were able to see um, the questions that they were asking, um, the responses that were generated, the follow-up questions they were doing. And it was actually, and you'll appreciate this, Christina, because I know this is an area that you care about a lot too, is that um, because it was given the top five hits of where they were getting information from, we actually did a ton of work on credible sources and media literacy work with them. Um, and that was kind of like the way that we started scratching the surface with them. Um, I was hesitant uh, originally to do that, but um, it, it worked out really well. Um, and the kids really use it as like a knowledge, uh, a knowledge building experience. And then I was able to see what information they were getting, then teaching them how to cross check by look and looking at those websites, revising those sources. Um, it was another way. And you know, when, uh, when we have, and I know Amia, you know, you know, one of my students, uh, who did who did a research report he wanted to do his biography on a famous baseball player in Japan and he you know he does a little he he actually he actually presented this at a teachers conference where he said what am i supposed to do if they don't have it in the library and i can't find anything like what am i supposed to do he's like so i tried perplexity and i was able to find some information and i was able to get rid of um the sources that didn't make sense and um and that's really exciting because I, I hadn't been able to really kind of like crack that to this extent um, for a long time. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's that. I mean, I it like I was just saying, like how to support interest driven work, right? Mm -hmm. It's a complex. <laughs> it's it's like it's like people we want to do it and yet it's hard and this this provides something that we've just never had before in terms of supporting that cuts that pat those like interest driven pathways is really interesting. And another thing I was thinking from a while, a while ago, and this isn't like a directly AI thing, but I think it goes back to what you just said, Christina, about um, Jill and I and prep and um, the, the work that we do mm -hmm. with the students with writing. I love that you're taking pieces from eighth grade and you're looking at them again. Um, amazing. <laughs> really amazing because it shows the value of what you created and that um, your sparks have meaning and they can come back to you now as you're I don't know, 14, 15, 16, and then they can come back to you when you're 25. Um, and, and the fact that you're saving it, that you're looking at it, you're, I mean, it's, it's really incredible. I mean, I think that's, that's the dr dream sometimes for us from that human element of, of the writing. So um, I just, I just love that, that you're going back in. I think um, uh, Ashna was talking, uh, she, maybe she said she had put her TED talk in. I'm, I'm thinking, was that her TED talk from last year? Because I know that Adita, you guys just did TED talks, right? In eighth grade? Yeah, we just finished yeah. those. Um, Mr. Ronsky, the deadline is August 31st. So I was talking with Mr. Ronsky before school ended. 
So, so I'm going to probably end up revising and hopefully submitting to the official competition this year. My TED Talk was also coincidentally all, all on AI. You should. There's actually, do you guys do, um, are, are you guys do, does she do student, student ed? Is that what she's doing? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So they have the, yeah that's great. They have a contest. I ended up joining, yeah. I ended up joining also that they have like the TED Connect week events that they do. That's what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think I ended up joining the human rights one. Uh, when was it like, oh, October now? Feels like a long time ago. Yeah, they put out a lot of really great experiences um, for young people a couple times a year. Yeah, I mean, for me, I really miss her class because we used to write so much because now, like in ninth grade, I didn't even write one, like one piece about myself, like nothing and nothing about like my own thoughts really at all. Besides like talking, I mean, not really nothing. And I miss that because in her class, we used to write like just just write like free write 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 about like some inspirational piece we were given every single day like that's that's all we did and I think that helped me become a better writer so much and even with like essays now I'm better because of how much writing I did in her class and I miss that so I mean I think writing about yourself is a really important piece of becoming a better student because I mean, it also uses your personal voice. Like, it, it's such a big part of writing. I know that she does like run like writing classes and stuff after school. If you do, if you, I was in it this year. It's really fun, honestly. Okay. That's great. Well, I know that we're at nine o'clock um, on East Coast time. Um, Cause I know Paul, you're probably not on East Coast time, right? <laughs> So I know that um, even if anybody wanted to share a final thought, a final idea um, before we wrap it up for the week, go ahead. Um, I would love if um, Paul and and if you if you would like put your email in for students for innovation, and you could let us know if you have any students or if you know any students who would be passionate about the project. And I mean, we'll we'll send out content. Um, I'll send the link to the to the website in the chat. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Paul, I was going to let you talk just because I've been talking a lot. Oh, Paul, I think your microphone might be muted. Yeah. Oh, he might be having trouble. Oh, 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 okay. There it is. <laughs> okay. It's it's weird, it's not registering that I'm trying to turn it on. And then and then it goes on and I click it again. So it's like a three stooges kind of thing happening here. Uh, I did put my email in at uh, students for innovation. I'm wondering, I haven't received that confirmation email yet. Are you doing that? On your side, it's not doing oh. it. Yeah, that's that's Miss Winnick, but um, okay. I, yeah, well, okay. yeah. a human being on the other side is going to wave that through probably at some point. So. I'll tell her. I'll tell her to watch. I'm not involved. I, I I'm not involved with students for innovation. I'm like a like a eager supporter um, because I think of, of what they're doing is very exciting. But I'm going to be with Alana tomorrow. I will tell her to watch out for your email. <laughs> okay, that's great. And it's going to look like a weird one because we're dot school. Okay. Like it's, it's really throwing people, you know, like if you don't have like a dot com or something like yeah. dot school. Um, this, yeah, this is really something tonight. Uh, and I'm sure you have uh, a lot of people in close proximity that tell you um, how proud of they are of the work that you're doing. So maybe it'd be helpful for, you know, somebody from the Midwest, you know, uh, uh, who's your country, uh, you know, the capital of basketball, uh, to tell you, I think you guys are doing, uh, you know, young people are doing fantastic work. And I had not, because there's so much, there's so much out there with AI, I had not heard of perplexity. And when I'm thinking of, third grade students, this is the limitation that I might be putting on a third grader is like, you know, are we looking at Wonderopolis? You know, what are we looking for for our source material? But no, if we're going out there perplexity, 
Um, I just had an oddball question I wanted to ask it. I wanted to ask it in the most obscure way I could, because uh, I'm doing a presentation in November on the affordances of digital spaces in student voice and agency. So I was just like, you know, I'm trying to take it from a natural perspective. What are the natural affordances that anything gains when it's in an environment, when it's in a place, when it's nurtured and it's cared for? And that's exactly the way I asked the question. And perplexity gave me like seven or eight really, really good articles back. So I'm starting to kind of question myself, like, how do people come up with these really great research articles? Like, off the, you know, they're probably asking really good questions of the tools that are available. And I love um, if it was Miss Lombardo, if it was uh, Amelia who said this, um, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do when my library is limited and I can't get to the resource material? I'm just uh, cash in, D don't do the work. That can't be the answer in 2025. If I can't find the answer, I just walk away. We need people asking good questions. We need people pursuing good responses if we can't get good answers. So, thank you. Thank you. Here, here. <laughs> I think this, this this just reminded me of what I did my TED talk on because my TED talk was on how not just AI but how AI could be used in a developing world, and that is exactly what I was going for. People who might not have access to like libraries or uh, other sources, AI is the perfect thing. It, it can be a teacher, as uh, an infinite wealth of knowledge, uh, someone to bounce ideas off of, all in one. Awesome. Cool. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye, you. everybody. See you next week. See you then. See you. Bye.